So as people are coming in, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this very special lecture. My name is Markus Stock. I'm the principal of University College and a professor of German and medieval studies. With the event this afternoon, we welcome our new Richard Charles Lee Chair in Chinese Canadian Studies, Professor Larissa Lai. We're exceedingly grateful that Professor Lai has agreed to share her research with us today. Her lecture is entitled Echolocating Asian Canadian Studies. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge uh, the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the uh, traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I ask you to take a moment to reflect on the Indigenous histories of the land upon which you live and work, wherever you're situated, while you join us for this presentation. University College is pleased to be able to host this hybrid lecture today. The Richard Charles Lee Chair in Chinese Canadian Studies is a crown jewel of UC's teaching and research. And I would like to specifically acknowledge the leadership of the Honorable Dr. Vivian Poi, former member of the Canadian Senate and former Chancellor of the University of Toronto in establishing this chair as a significant constituent of the Canadian Studies Programme at University College. Dr. Vivian Poi and her husband Neville are among our esteemed guests uh, this afternoon. So let me add a heartfelt thank you to Vivian and Neville Poi for being such great friends to the college and the institution as a whole. Dr. Poi, your significant vision to the benefit of Chinese Canadian studies and Asian Canadian studies has contributed so much to University College the University of Toronto, and the country as a whole. The objective of the Richard Charles Lee Chair in Chinese Canadian Studies is to support research and teaching on topics related to Chinese Canadian and Asian Canadian Studies at the University of Toronto. It is, of course, Professor Larissa Lai, who holds the distinguished position of the Richard Charles Lee Chair in Chinese Canadian Studies. Uh, and has been doing so for a couple of months. So we're so uh, grateful and so happy to have you here. On behalf of the college, I am very much looking forward to the talk that Professor Lai will be delivering tonight. Some quick housekeeping notes before we get going. That's always the kind of spiel that we have to do because it's a hybrid lecture. For those of you attending in person, and thank you so much uh, for coming out, a microphone will be passed around during the Q&A portion of today's lecture, after the lecture. Please raise your hand to ask a question once the lecture concludes. Please speak into the microphone rather than speaking without one in order for our audience online to be able to hear your questions. So please wait for the microphone. Uh, I'm sure after the lecture, we'll have many questions and, and many good things to discuss wait for it so that the people online can hear your question as well. For those attending virtually, live closed captioning is available for this event. The option can be turned on by clicking the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your screen. You can also please use the Q&A function to submit your questions and someone in this room will monitor them and will relay them to the speaker. I would now like to call upon my colleague, Professor Robert Diaz, Director of the Canadian Studies Program at UC and an Associate Professor in the Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto to more formally introduce our distinguished speaker. Rob. Uh, thank you, Principal Marcus Stock, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to the evening today. Um, it is truly an honor to introduce Professor Larissa Lai, Charles Lee Chair in Chinese Canadian Studies at University of Toronto. Over the course of nearly three decades, Professor Lai has contributed creative writing, critical scholarship, and community organizing, which have indelibly shaped the directions of Asian North American studies more specifically and Canadian studies more broadly. Her noteworthy and widely taught books include the novels When Foxes a Thousand, 
first published in 1995, Saltfish Girl published in 2002, The Tiger Flu published in 2018, and most recently, The Lost Century published in 2022. Professor Lai has also co-authored a book of poetry entitled Sybil Unrest with Rita Wong, published in 2009, and co-edited two scholarly volumes, namely Land Relations, Possibility for Justice in Canadian Literatures with Smara Cambarelli, published in 2022, as well as Tracing the Lines, Reflections on Contemporary Poetics and Cultural Politics in Honor of Roy Miki with Maya Joseph, Christine Kim, and Christopher Lee, published in 2013. And there's many, many more books, uh, articles, uh, chapters, et cetera, et cetera, to name. Um, of the many acc accolades she has received, Professor Lai has been the recipient of the Jim Duggins Novelist Prize, the Lambda Literary Award, the Astrea Award, and the other Wise Honor Book Award. Her books have also been finalists for prestigious uh, awards, including the Gabrielle Roy Prize for Literary Criticism, the Dorothy Livesey Poetry Prize, and the Governor General's Award. More recently, she was a Maria Zambrano Fellow at the University of Huelva in Spain and Canada Research Chair at the University of Calgary, where she directed the Insurgent Architects House for Creative Writing. On a more personal note, I first met Professor Lai seven years ago over an intimate meal with Lillian Allen, Ronald Cummings, and Rita Wong. So I was really fangirling during that time, having read her work um, as an undergrad, actually, and as a grad student. Artists and thinkers whose words continue to inspire my pedagogy in politics today. Having been familiar with her numerous contributions to multiple fields of knowledge, I was immediately struck by how the scope of Professor Lai's accomplishments also seemed to be proportional to the humility and generosity she demonstrated during, during our first encounter. She asked me questions about my experiences as an immigrant to Canada only five years prior. As I shared about the interrelated realities of being queer and Filipino, I felt the caring attentiveness of an individual whose multiple identities and life experiences have become meaningful entry points for how she engages with, listens to, and empathizes with others. The ethics of care and collectivity consistently appear in Professor Lai's writing too as she centers Black, Brown, Indigenous, and other marginalized knowledge formations in histories. She animates and advocates for the potentialities of what she calls, quote, insurgent utopias, or spaces of narration, speculation, and imagination, where emergent practices of, quote, attentive listening to the active and positive content of the other can, and, can transpire. And so, as we encounter Professor Lai's insights this evening, I invite us to similarly feel and channel these insurgent utopias, marking and moving with the complex contradictions, possibilities, dreams, and freedoms they engender. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm bowled over by these kind introductions. And it's really wonderful to see, oh, many, Many friendly faces in the audience this afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. I'm just gonna, I'm at that moment where no, there are no glasses that are ideal, um, but these ones will allow me to read. Only well, now I can't see you, but. <laughs> so my talk uh, this afternoon is called Echolocating Asian Canadian Studies, Night Flight Through a Discipline. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit on whose traditional land we're meeting today. My appreciation to the Honorable Dr. Vivian Poy, Principal Marcus Stock, Robert Diaz, and Dr. Dr. Robert Diaz, and Dr. Siobhan O'Flynn for the generous support of this talk and my work here at University College. Though these acknowledgements are brief, they're not merely pro forma. I hope as the talk unfolds, it will become clear why these relationships matter. The last time I wrote about the state of the discipline, in my 2014 book, Slanting Eye, Imagining We, I argued that Asian Canadian is an emergent category, one that comes into being differently each time it is asserted, whether through particular events, like Yellow Peril Reconsidered, Desh Pardesh, the Earth Spirit Festival, the Powell Street Fest Festival, or Literation, 
or through dedicated journals like the Asian Indian and Rung magazine, as well as through special issues like the Awakening Thunder special issue of Fireweed, um, or the very inside, uh, sorry, or the four different, um, very different Asian Canadian special issues of the journal Canadian Literature. It emerges yet again differently through anthologies, whether the very inside, Voices Rising, or the Asian Canadian Studies Reader. And you'll see just some of them up on the up on the up on the screen. There are many other instances I could cite. An earlier version of this talk attempted to do so, but I was overwhelmed by the sheer number of writers, activists, artists, scholars, organizers, workers, philanthropists, and more who have contributed to the building of Asian Canadian community. We may sometimes suffer for visibility, but we are not suffering for critical mass. In our contemporary moment, especially in the wake of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Black Lives Matter, though these are only the most recent instantiations of centuries long struggles, decolonization is a major imperative, even as we watch out for misuses of the term. If we were aware before, we become even more aware of what our black and indigenous brothers and sisters have survived and how they've thrived. And we are newly committed to a different kind of life together in the wake of COVID, as China becomes a more troubling entity, as bombs rain down on the Gaza Strip, as we forget the post-structural destabilizations of identities and veer sharply into the polarizations of contemporary identities in local, national, and global politics. As right wings rise and democracy falls under threat, it seems imperative to ask what Asian Canadian studies and Asian Canadian cultural, cultural and political commitments can and should be now. For indeed, anti-Asian racism remains an active force in our lives, particularly as it affects elders, sex workers, as well as disabled, queer, and trans members of our communities. It has long-standing historical roots in the Chinese Immigration Act, otherwise known as the Exclusion Act of 1923, 100 years ago this year, which replaced the already cruel and cumbersome Chinese head tax. It has roots in the Order in Council of 1942 that branded loyal Japanese Canadians as enemy aliens and gave the Minister of Justice power to detain any one of them without trial and led in short order to their uprooting from British Columbia and the confiscation of their worldly goods. It has roots in the Komagata Maru incident of 1914, when the federal and provincial government denied entry to 376 passengers from Punjab into British Columbia on the grounds that they had not made a continuous journey from their point of origin. The memory of these and many other incidents of anti-Asian racism have given us the impetus to organize, gather, think, write, and talk. In the spirit of community-rooted agency, I want to center the lives and practices of Asian Canadian writers, thinkers, activists, and artists. I want to consider the stories and shapes of justice, but also who and what, who and what we might be responsible to, and the necessary and evolving frames under which the work is done. My own methods have been those of community-based cultural production, contemporary poetics, and speculative fiction. And it's in the spirit of these three ways of knowing that now, in the long ongoing wake of, the, of COVID, that I turn to the bat. Many in this room will likely remember that the bat is an animal suspected as the origin for COVID-19. Bats are known for their tendencies to harbor and mutate coronaviruses. While it, is known that there were, while it is known that there were no bats at the Huanan Seafood Wholesale Market in Wuhan in the weeks prior to the outbreak, they remain a key suspect as the original incubator for the disease. The raccoon dog is suspected as the potential intermediate host. Obviously, it matters to me what science discovers with regards to the origin of the pandemic. However, as a writer and cultural critic, I'm additionally interested in the imaginal field that guides hypotheses. This field is as cultural, historical, and political as it is objective. I read the cultural and imaginal, and imaginal terrain in order to make sense of the PRC government's erasure of the evidence and to, to diagnose the roots of contemporary anti-Asian racism. 
I'm interested in how the cultural and the imaginal produce real material effects that then interact with other material effects in order to produce collective and individual experience, what we used to simply call history. The revulsion that many Western observers feel with regards to the wet market reverberates through a long historical association of Asians with disease, in spite of the West's own history of unsavory and unethical practice, graveyard robbery in the service of anatomical knowledge, not the least among them. But this is not to play holier than thou, especially not now as contemporary geopolitics are shifting in ways that, that can potentially hit Asian Canadian subjects both coming and going. Nevertheless, one can't help wonder whether the Chinese government's rapid destruction of the evidence is connected to a desire to shut down a long-standing racist trope about Chinese eating habits. In other words, a long-standing stru struggle with aesthetics, specifically culinary aesthetics, and how these play into the work of race and racialization. I want to recognize as well that the use of animals and animal parts is connected to an, al an alternate medicine. Bats in particular have been used against eye afflictions and excessive per perspiration, among other health problems. It is not just an aesthetic border that is crossed when one enters or exits the real and imaginal wet market. It is also an epistemological one in which what constitutes good medicine is understood differently. As we approach the wet market, and for that matter, the lab leak theory, suggesting that COVID escaped a lab in Wuhan, we find ourselves caught up in an aesthetic and, and affective field in which older forms of East-West unease present themselves anew as a kind of haunting. Culturally and imaginatively, China becomes a place both too much mired in the past of traditional medicine or, uh, contradictorily, too much of a risky, undesirable future in which minimally regulated scientists are unable to push the boundaries of science ethics to test gain-of-function theories that might produce extrapotent viruses that are all too likely to escape. The science fictional aesthetics of COVID especially as they sit in relation to older racist aesthetics around Asians and disease, strike me as only too capable of producing anti-Asian racism as if by design. To track Western anxieties about Chinese medicine, but also to illustrate how useful, um, uh, how useful old knowledges are entwined with those anxieties, I offer a fragment from an entry on bats from the botanist and missionary Frederick Porter Smith in his Materia Medica and Natural History of China, published in 1871. Quote, the bat's medicinal properties are rated at considerable value by the Chinese. From its asserted extreme longevity and its excellent sight, this curious creature is credited by the Chinese with the power of conveying these desirable qualities to those who consume the disgusting preparations made from all parts of its body. This bald invocation of disgust likely strikes us as dated, to say the least. The culture of tolerance in liberal Canada dictates that we not use such words. And yet, the racist affect that emerges from the description of bat materials used in that 19th century invocation remains at work beneath the surface. In her important 2007 work on affect theory and contemporary aesthetics, Ugly Feelings, Cyan Nye writes, if the disgusting is always that which is insistent and intolerable, tolerance is always, in some fundamental way, a negation of disgust. Benevolent tolerance is, in fact, a barely disguised euphemism for a pity that at times seems to verge on contempt. Though Nye addresses the social labor of disgust in a broad US literary con context, her thoughts on the relationship between disgust and tolerance are useful in a Canadian one. Um, in the long wake of official multiculturalism, the even longer wake of an unofficial one, which sees tolerance as a response not to disgust as such, but to cultural difference. The relationship between disgust and difference is in fact made clear through reading such texts as Smith's. The friendly contempt with which the lawyer regards Bartleby in Nye's essay has 
its echoes in the humor evident in Smith's description of the medicinal uses of a preparation called night bright sand. This dark brown coarse powder looking something like tea dust and consisting of the debris of the mylabis insect, dirt, bat stung, and other extraneous substances. The Chinese apply it to the eyes as a powder or a wash. They profess to detect the eyes of the mosquitoes on which the creature feeds in this, um, on this excrement. It is applied with sugar to foul ulcers, a practice which the writer strongly recommends minus the bat stung. It is curious here the Chinese seem to have awkwardly imitated the Western practice of using cantharides in the treatment of chronic diseases of the eye. As I register the othering humor in Smith's report, I distill also his reading of the work of a sympathetic magic, the detection of mosquito eyes in bat dung and their potential to aid in curing eye troubles in humans, as though acute visual power might transfer from the mosquito and possibly also the bat to humans under the correct medical conditions. Smith also remarks upon the seeming imitation of Western practices in the use of insects to treat eye diseases. In fact, however, it has been a long-standing practice of traditional Chinese medicine to use a wide variety of organic materials from plant and animal sources for at least the last 3,000 years except for grabs the question of who has been borrowing from whom, at what time, and to what ends. Clearly, claims to origin are tied up in questions of power. The affective valence of traditional medical practices read across cultures or across temporal shifts remains tangled in both power relations and ideas of national belonging. Still, correct or not, what is interesting here is, is Smith's reading of a Chinese sympathy for Western practice, his reading of an impulse to copy, that is to echo without exactitude, but rather through the means and materials at one's own disposal. For the record, I'll register that the practice of mimicry goes both ways. The British adoption of Chinese um, ceramic practices and the habit of tea drinking would be obvious examples. But there's not much point arguing with a missionary from 1871. It's more important to see how the cultural norms he carries have their reverberations in the present. However, while I'm speaking of dinnerware and Chinese arts more broadly, I want to, no to note um, a long-standing Chinese practice of the rebus, another kind of echoic practice that relies on the homophone to image and call into being needed thoughts, concepts, or wishes. As in, for instance, the images of the rice grain, me, and the rabbit, tu, by young Chinese feminists over the past decade to make claims for themselves in solidarity with other women while evading state surveillance in the Me Too movement. With regards to the bat, there is a common invocation of, of luck in the term Wu Fu, five blessings, which sounds identical to Wu Fu meaning five bats. The rebus articulates the desire for blessings decoratively in ceramics and other art. It is through these thoughts on reverberations, mimicry, and imitation that I arrive at last at the figure of the echo and the practice of echolocation as a technique practiced by bats to find their way in the dark. In fact, as it turns out, without sight through the use of an extraordinarily acute sense of hearing. Bats find their way in the dark by making their own noises and listening in real time for the ways um, the echoes of their own vocalizations return to them. I turn to Donald Redfield Griffin's Cold War era classic, Echoes of Bats and Men, with apologies again for the dated language, for a description of how precisely bats' ability to self-locate through, through vocalization and listening, in other words, echolocation, works. Here it is, though I won't read it for the sake of time. It's a lovely description of, of, bat, of bats swooping through the dark um, to catch insects, um, using, using their hearing to echo off the insects' bodies. I offer this research as a bit of poetical thinking that I hope might be useful for echolocating Asian Canadian studies as it zigzags through the present. 
I think of poetics as a kind of unmethod against contemporary impasses in favor of productive ways of living together. Specifically, I take up Fred Waugh's idea of poetics as, quote, what surrounds you like your house, it's where you live, unquote. And Joan Retlack's articulations of poet poetics as dubious prototypes for difficult processes and as long range inquiries and exercises of the imagination that are an entirely contingent, contingent practice of reasoned agency. In this particular iteration of my own poetics, I invoke the figure of the bat, the COVID bat, the medicinal bat, and the five bats of blessing to call us into surprising imitations and the work of the echo. I ask poetically, if we can incubate back bat viruses and get sick the way they do, can we also take on their abilities to sonically self-locate? For indeed, as Griffin notes, humans have learned much from dolphins use of sonar to locate submarines in a Cold War context and other underwater entities that exist beneath the, the depth to which light will travel. I note in addition that much of contemporary deep space exploration is done in a similar way. Astrophysicists use waveform patterning to detect galaxies beyond the Milky Way, um, black holes, quasars, and, and all other kinds of deep space phenomena. Griffin seeks other mimicries too. His book is framed around the use of echolocation by blind people and asks how we can look to bats, dolphins to enhance that ability. This is not to deny the intimate nature of the work. I take up the bat in order to include the viral in my concept of echolocation and to recognize the biological, the social, the cultural and the political modes that this way of thinking and being might offer. In so doing, I query a range of frameworks, proximities, and languages that ask whether, literally or metaphorically, we might use echolocation as a technique to locate Asian Canadian studies in relation to a range of adjacent and overlapping disciplines, community bases, and practices. Echolocation becomes a productive, poetical way to think about the geometries of our attention so that we can work oppositionally when we need to, but in parallel or at right angles to other formations when necessary. It becomes a way in a sense for Echo in the story of Narcissus and Echo to break the curse laid on her by Juno and return to having a voice of her own. Dina Alkasim, reading Gayatri Spivak, reading Ovid, considers Echo as a subaltern figure, sometimes human, sometimes animal, and sometimes of the earth. Al Qasim writes, just as Narcissus knows nothing of the lake that returns his gaze, but falls captive to his own aesthetic knowledge given back to him as self-knowledge, so the sovereign imagination knows nothing of the complex ecology surrounding it and cannot be reduced to intentions, good or bad. Echo remains unheard and unremarked. I find it helpful to annotate John William Waterhouse's romantic era painting, Echo and Narcissus from 1903 to help visualize this. Um, so if we think of, of Narcissus as a sovereign state, the sovereign state is absorbed in his own self-regard um, and thinks he sees the other when he is only looking at his own self-reflection. The actual other, woman, the stones, the water, the trees, maybe even the bats hanging unseen in their branches, remains unseen, completely disregarded. But Narcissus can never hold or truly love the reflected self as other. His is a deeply melancholy position. Only in death is he transformed, part of the land at last. With what remains of your generous attention, what I'd like to do is map out one Asian Canadian bat's zigzagging flight through the discipline of Asian Canadian studies for one contemplative early evening, voicing my route against surfaces and depths to echolocate myself in relation to others. One, the community-based route of Asian Canadian cultural practice in the 1960s and 1970s. To understand the 1960s and 1970s as a starting point for Asian Canadian studies is one meaningful way to go. Temporally speaking, of course, this is incorrect. 
It's better to think of the moment as a refractive surface and depth against which our bat protagonist might sound herself. What the moment productively illustrates is the need to center community and fight injustice. In the 60s and 70s, the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop was born, as was the Powell Street Festival and the radio show under Guy. Publications like Gum San Bo, uh, the Powell Street Review, the Asian Canadian, and the anthology Inalienable Rice emerged from it. The protest against the W5 campus giveaway episode took place in 1979, and from it, the Chinese Canadian National Council was born in 1980. In light of the recent publication of Angie Wong's Laughing Back at Empire, the grassroots activism of the Asian Canadian ma magazine, there was more to say about that moment in general and the Asian Canadian in particular than there was mere months ago. I want to recognize how few and far between these kinds of studies are and how important, especially as a generation is passing. In the past six years, we've lost Sid Tan, Jim Wong Chu, and Tony Chan. If there's something that captures the spirit of the time in a way that resonates with our own, it's perhaps the inscrutable Occidental Dubious Awards which Wong discusses following an excellent earlier documentation and analysis by Alice Jim with palpable glee. The dubious awards were a regular feature of the Asian of the Asianadian in which Wong writes, the magazine could reclaim and demystify harmful stereotypes and inaccurate representations of, of Asians, while at the same time exposing a truth about mainstream Canada that was less benign than its self-image as a peaceful, multicultural nation seem to show. Here's an example cited by both Wong and Jim, along with the award jury's comments. It's a little bit small. The cartoon shows a caricatured Japanese bell bellhop following a delegation of North American leaders in a Tokyo hotel. The award jury writes, the cartoon reminds us of the fact that the offensive stereotype of Asians as subservient, myopic little children has not been erased from the new media. To my mind, the political and aesthetic strategy of the dubious award is classically echolocative in the sense that it duplicates a racist image in order to critique it. In other words, it repeats the image in order to make it mean the opposite of what it meant originally. In order for the reverse meaning to be audible, the body and the gaze of the Asian Canadian subject are also necessary. This is productive because it brings Asian Canadians into view. With the Asian Canadian jury looking, the meaning of the cartoon is reversed. Its meaning is no longer Asian subservience and becomes suddenly a rather embarrassing and pathetic white racism. The work of Echo on this pass is powerful and political because the body of the speaker enables the new meaning to be received. But the sword cuts both ways. On its return pass, it also locates Asian Canadian subjects anew in relation to white racism. Its critical power is refracted through the bodies of the Asian Canadian jury members. The phenomenon is precisely the master-slave dialectic as Franz Fanon reading Hegel taught us in Black Skin's White Masks. Both Wong and Jim document the burnout that caused the magazine to fold in 1985. I'd suggest that there exists a very particular embodied kind of exhaustion that emerges from just this kind of justice work as the sights and sounds of racist representation reverberate through the bodies of Asian Canadian subjects as a necessary precondition to articulating the problem. I want to recognize as well that the Asian Canadian, the, the Asian Canadian and the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop served primarily an East Asian constituency at the outset, dom dominated by people of Chinese and Japanese descent. South Asian writers, activists, artists, artists, intellectuals, and organizers, as well as our brothers and sisters with roots in Southeast Asia, made their way into the project later though. Donald Gelnisht remarks that over time, the Asian Canadian became a genuinely pan-ethnic journal. In the meantime, South Asian artists and writers were organizing. Many years later, I met the incredible Sadhu Binning and Ajmer Rode, who had been involved in Punjabi community in the Lower Mainland for decades, 
along with Sergi Kalsi, organizing and keeping Punjabi culture alive. Binning was part of a theatrical group known as Vancouver Sath, which produced plays representing social issues. In 1982, the Toronto South Asian Review began publishing. And slightly later, in 1988, the Desh Pardesh Arts Festival focusing on queer South Asian culture in Toronto was, to my mind, one of the most extraordinary and exciting feats of community-based cultural organizing. The magazine that emerged from Desh Pardesh and from the initiative of um, Zul Solomon and Sherazad Jamal, Rung, continues its work in the present in very interesting kinship building ways. Two, Asian American literature, ethnic studies, and US civil rights movements. As the late and much missed Donald Gelnish notes in his controversial yet so influ influential and beautifully researched article, A Long Labor, The Protracted Birth of Asian Canadian Literature, um, the Vietnam War was a formative event for Asian Americans, driving the on-campus culture of US civil rights in the 1960s and 1970s. That protests took place in university administrators' offices registers the deep, if discomforting, int intimacy between the work of protest and the work of the academy. While many of us criticized Gelnish for reading Asian Canadian practice as deficient in relation to Asian American studies, what remains is a thorough and careful articulation of both community-rooted and institutional unfoldings on either side of the 49th parallel. Later, both Eleanor T. and Donald Gelnisht, both together and apart, worked on the, develop, on the development of an Asian North American framework, which is productive for articulating the many similarities and parallels between Asian Canadian and Asian American literatures. If one imagines Asian Canadian and Asian American as minoritized literatures under the national rubrics of Canadian literature and American literature, it is still very much possible to echolocate positions and relations across the border. We are, we are affected by so many parallel conditions, including head taxes, exclusion acts, railway work, and so many parallel stereotypes and forms of violence, including the violence of, anti, of the anti-Asian riots, which moved up and down the West Coast through the early 20th century with little regard for the border. Further, to emphasize the border is to reproduce a colonial convention against solidarity with our indigenous brothers and sisters and their struggle for decolonization and land back. This would be another reason to uphold Asian North American or even better, Turtle, a Turtle Island framework um, in order not to reproduce national framings in neo-colonial ways. To consider our Asianness as a key factor held in common rather than to take on Canadian or American nationalist modes also makes sense. We do this work, after all, to critique, to critique nationalist excess, not to hold it up. A final reason to hang on to Asian Canadian, Asian American relation is that Asian American studies has, since its inception, been in conversation with African American studies and is highly attuned to African American struggles for black civil rights. As Afua Cooper and others have taught us, slavery existed in Canada too. Black Canadian and Asian Canadian communities have worked in coalition with one another, both historically and at present, but the formation is different as I'll discuss in a few minutes. I'd suggest for now that both Black Canadian and Asian Canadian movements are indebted, substantially but not absolutely, to American civil rights movement for much of their power and analysis, as we have been in constant conversation with them across the porous border. Three, the reverberations of redress and multiculturalism in the 1980s and 1990s. With regards to questions of subject formation, Roy Miki's work is of tantamount importance. Because of his birth in the Japanese Canadian internment, and his activist roots in the um, Japanese Canadian redress movement, and because of his profound commitment to community combined with a committed position in the academy, he was ideally placed to bridge the gap. But more, his theory of agency was an extraordinarily productive one at just the right moment. Miki contemplates the problem of subjective agency for those relegated to the site of the Asian. 
thinking specifically of Japanese Canadian people in internment, branded as enemy aliens by their own country and uprooted from home and family, Miki says that Japanese subjects are molded by the dynamics of dispersal. He is thinking of the dispersal of the JC community by the orders in council that disenfranchised them, but also of subjectivities dispersed like clouds, unable to coalesce into a coherent whole. In echolocative terms, there's a reverberation of violence through the body that disrupts speech, language, and self-knowledge. Miki asks from what place such a subject can speak, even when the desire and sufficient self-coherence to attend the possibility might rise. He asks, quoting the Quebecois uh, feminist poet Gail Scott, what if the surfacing consciousness finds void instead of code? Speaking is possible, but not easy. Its temporalities are fractured and dispersed. It's a compelling coincidence that Japanese Canadian redress was achieved the same year that the Multiculturalism Act was passed. We don't tend to talk about them together because the two frames are not identical, though they do overlap. Echolocation pushes the, po pushes the possibility and indeed the necessity of putting them in conversation. Their simultaneity created a strange set of conditions in Asian Canadian communities in which we could see the possibilities of justice, but in which we were concurrently and paradoxically contained by a policy that appeared to free us. Exactly as the reverberation Miki describes in agency began to reverberate at a new frequency, subjective interiors propagandized and silenced by social and political exteriors strategically manufactured. As Richard Fung writes in the exhibition catalog for Yellow Peril Reconsidered, um, in an essay widely titled Multiculturalism, um, sorry, Richard Fung, I'm so sorry. Richard Fung writes in the exhibition catalog for Yellow Peril Reconsidered, um, in an essay widely entitled Multiculturalism Reconsidered, quote, multiculturalism shifts the focus away from political and social questions of race, such as housing, employment, education, access to power, into a political marketing of personal identity. It champions a notion of cultural difference in which people are encouraged to preserve cultural forms of song and dance they didn't practice before they came to Canada. Multiculturalism's function and threat has been to co-opt and, e and eclipse the potential threat of anti-racist organizing. Fung's recognition of the marketing of personal identity touches Miki Miki's thinking in the sense of recognizing that shallow forms of cultural production might have in fact repressed more deeply the psychic life of the Asian Canadian subject, pushing her to the vapid self-regarding site of narcissus while, um, while simultaneously producing a newly virulent cultural gain for the seemingly benevolent but actually managerial state. Further, somewhat depressingly, towards the end of the next decade, we witness the ways in which the government is able to mobilize apologies fought for as a matter of justice towards their opposite incorporation in the service of closure and state management. Gelnisch was right in his observation of the extraordinary capacity of the Canadian state to contain difference. However, what the 1980s and 1990s brought in spades were many important, um, ephemer though ephemeral events, including Desh Pardesh, Yellow Peril Reconsidered, Invisible Colors, Racy Sexy, the International Dub Festival, It's a Cultural Thing, The Appropriate Voice, and Writing Through Race, all of which were important for furthering the conversation and none of which were easy as it became more and more obvious how, how deeply repressed the histories and knowledges of indigenous black and Asian people on Turtle Island were. What was important about these events was the chance to showcase cultural production of many kinds, film, video, installation art, writing, chat books, book books, magazines, music, story, the simple sharing of experience, scholarship, and more. The embodied aspect of the gathering of the gatherings were key, um, even if it wasn't always easy. The cultural and political productivity of these events was immense, even as it remained so hard to art articulate, partly because the, of the ephemeral nature of the events, and partly because 
individual experiences of any particular, particular event varied so, wi wild, so widely. But I think that the wildly heterogeneous qualities of the events were also of tantamount importance. The events were productive and so formative because they opened up the field, the, they opened up the field of Asianness among other fields rather than containing them. The events were affectively heterogeneous. They carried the spirits of celebration, critique, rage, indignation, devastation, jealousy, laughter, joy, sexuality, bitterness, and memory with such rotating intensity that they could not be fully grasped. They were so very full of content, some of which I've shared, but all of which has not yet been documented. Some of the most important content was a fresh round of coalition building across Indigenous, Black, and Asian locations. Though the term people of color obscured important specificities, it also put a wide range of communities in conversation with one another. We began to learn anew one another's histories, practices, struggles, and ways of seeing. The way we did this was far from perfect, and yet in working together, we were put into conversation. These many and varied gatherings were so immensely productive, and I'm so grateful to have been part of at least some of them. And yet, there was a horrible aspect to them too. One key problem was the syndrome of one of each, which the ever, ever astute Richard Fung noticed very early on. Multiculturalism's most destructive tendency was to pit racialized communities against one another by making an equal valencing of vastly incommensurate racial positions that were not at all parallel, but in fact profoundly and unequally entangled. It had a tendency to triangulate relationships among Black, Indigenous, and Asian positions through whiteness, which obscured possibilities for coalition, solidarity, relation, or kinship. With these analyses still ahead of us, and, the, and in the early years, the concept of intersectionality, available but not fully absorbed, and in any case, not fully sufficient. The complex struggles among so-called people of color, as well as the struggles within community groups viewed from the outside as homogenous, became so painful as to make the decade as it came to a close almost uninhabitable. In addition to differences in racial formations and identifications, there were class differences, gender differences, differences in sexuality, differences in access to the metropole, and so many more. While I believe that difference is strength, the fact of the matter is that difference needs inhabitation, articulation, analysis, and the time to be psychically and aff affectively worked through. No banner, least of all the state ma a state manage management banner like multiculturalism, is sufficient to contain this, and thank goodness it shouldn't be contained. Shoulders of those who participated, and what continues to reverberate through the bodily being of so many of us is the necessity and impossibility of working through all the disconnections. Our work has to be to try. Recent calls for humility, especially by the brilliant and undersung Warren Carew, strike me as of tantamount importance. I would add to that my own call for an ethics of the unfinished and a recognition that hard drives to closure tend to produce unintended violence. And yet the work that was done in the aftermath of the multicultural act, multi, multi, Multiculturalism Act's passing was more than the song and dance that Richard Fung feared. For indeed, as Smaro Cambarelli has observed, those called into being by the act could and did use its resources against the grain. They used it in the service of becoming more than the beings the state hoped to appease and contain through the act. Both coalitions and critical capacity were built, even if they were imperfect, even if there were things that not everyone could see all at once. In the meantime, all through the 1990s, the slow wave of immigration from Hong Kong that had begun in the 1960s picked up pace as a so-called return to China approached then passed in 1997. Immigration from all over Asia has since increased and the current population consists of both people who lived through the struggles here on Turtle Island from the 1960s through to the turn of the millennium and those who lived out those years in other places and in different ways. Three, and this is the last section, the new millennium. 
The new millennium brought with it the federal government apology for the Chinese head tax and acknowledgement of the Chinese Exclusion Act. We, mark, we marked the 100th anniversary of that terrible racist piece of legislation on July 1st of this year. While the apology was an important achievement, hard fought by many activists, including the late and much missed Sid Tan, it's important to recognize that its harms are not past and that Chinese Canadian community is fundamentally shaped by historical legislation that limited our ability to thrive, that divided our families primarily, as Yun Fong Wun has noted, by keeping Chinese women out, which created profound cultural disjunctures within the community and in so doing shaped lives in ways that continue to echo in the present moment. Gender and sexuality questions matter here. Richard Fung's work on queer intimacies among the Chinese bachelors is important and much under-recognized. What strikes me as important with regard to what Henry Yu would call this anniversary of, anniversary of change is the extraordinary organizing that has been conducted in fact for decades in order to bring head tax redress about. I remember having conversations with Jim Wong Chu about it in the mid 1980s. And I remember Sid Tan's passionate longstanding work and his support, often with the activist musician Sean Gunn at his side of the elders who paid the head tax. Having met Jerry Osborne and watched her moving film Unwanted Soldiers about her father, Alex Louis, um, other Chinese Canadian war vets and their struggle for the right to fight for Canada and its implications for the Chinese Canadian franchise. I can see how the thread of Chinese Canadian organizing goes back to the 1940s. Mary Chapman's recent work on the mixed race Chinese English Montreal based Eaton sisters takes the work back to the 1930s. There was engagement north of the 49th long before the 1960s. We need to pay attention to when and how memory surfaces and for what reasons. As we recognize the important work of those who went before us, it's important too to recognize the framework, the frameworks in which the struggles take place. Uh, sorry, it's important to recognize the framework in which the struggle has taken place. Specifically, we need to recognize that state redress and apology are not decolonization. Sunera Tobani notes that when we fight for our rights within the bounds of the colonial state, we strengthen the colonial state. Redress is paradoxically and painfully both a form of justice and a form of colonial reinforcement. Because it reinforces colonial land theft, its justice is incomplete. This doesn't make us bad or wrong for wanting it. It's an understandable and meaningful thing to want. But insofar as we get justice for this violence, we have a deeper responsibility to indigenous lands and indigenous peoples. Paul Yee's recent novel, A Superior Man, recognizes this problem with great beauty and compassion. A productive question to ask within a decolonial frame would be, who has the right to admit or deny us? We could recognize the Moachat admission of Chinese builders aboard ships on the voyages of Captain Mears, who settled in Yuquat, otherwise known as Friendly Cove or Nootka, with Moachat permission in the late 1700s, well before the formation of the Canadian state. If we want Chinese railway, laundry, and restaurant labor recognized, we need to recognize as well the brutal labor and property politics on Turtle Island and through the Caribbean that unhomed black people made them into property and stole their bodies and their labor. Again, it doesn't make us bad or wrong for wanting our histories of suffering recognized. We did suffer, this must be seen. But the seeing puts the onus on us to recognize the suffering of others. We also need to examine how both states and capitalism have obfuscated our view of this connection and fight against it, even if it is hard and painful. This is the upshot of Lisa Lowe's important work and the need to echolocate our work against other frames, including Asian North, the Asian North American frame, the Asian American frame, the turn to diaspora, global frameworks, the minor Asia, Asia's frame, and the frame of the planetary itself. We need to echolocate our own struggles in relation to those of others, especially black and indigenous people, and especially through the politics of land, labor, and bodies, but I also hope through practices of relation-making and kinship. 
By echolocating Asian Canadian studies through these frames and relationships, we see and hear more deeply the real and serious reverberations of history. The turn of the millennium also brought with it the drive to institutionalize, activated in practice at the University of Toronto, where I'm so proud and happy to be, and the University of British Columbia. It also brought new research and useful new concepts. Lily Cho's turn to diaspora, Smarl Cambarelli's concept of scandal, Chris Lee's work on aesthetic mediation, and Renisa Mawani's work on shifts in state enforcements of identity through the law. Rita Wong, Melissa Fung, and yours truly have been working on questions of Asian Indigenous relation. Nancy Kang has been thinking about the relationship between Asianness and Blackness. The refugee scholarship of Vin Nguyen, T. Fu, and the late Yi Dang Chuang is so important, and it's great to see it getting attention now. Tanya Aguilera Wei, Rita Wong, Cecilia Chen, and many others have been working on questions of ecology, the environment, and climate change. The need to recognize Asian Canadian work in Asian languages newly brings to light work that has been ongoing for decades by scholars and artists like Lian Chao, Lai Fong Leung, Sadhu Binning, and Ajmer Rode. As this one bat includes her night flight through a discipline, I consider the relationship between the ticky box of data collection forms and the echo chamber. We might think of the echo chamber as echo's revenge. She's relegated to closed and closed boxes of identity because there's nowhere quite for her to find a voice in a fully public sphere, um, if such a thing even continues to exist. The internet recognizes the orient, sorry, the internet reorganizes the orientation of exteriors to interiors, public spheres to private quarters, social worlds to psychic landscapes. Between the strangeness of our lives online and the new publics and new intimacies created by COVID, like SARS and AIDS before it, the ways we are configured psychically and socially have to change. Disinformation fed by capital concentration and new health conditions experienced en masse produce new chambers in which strange echoes haunt us. What's an infected bat to do? For indeed, the animal kingdom is also suffering from the viruses and spores released by human interference in their habitats and capital-induced climate change. How can a bat infected by COVID or sick with white nose syndrome caused by the spores of Pseudogymnoacus destructans, yes, I had to practice that, um, here in an echo chamber seeded with disinformation? When the consent of the infected swooping through a field of porous, roiling, manufactured echo chambers produces the world, how can echo know where to fly? Calling out is how she knows herself. She can only call louder, seeking surfaces and substrates that might still offer a path, a safe flight for one night, a little something to eat and companions to call to. She listens for their voices calling out in return to hear and be comforted by them as they echo back to her in the dark. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Professor Lai, for um, the provocative, exciting, um, creative, and really compelling uh, talk and, and really challenged to us, I think, to think about Asian Canadian, otherwise via vibration, sensations, and sound. Um, I'd like to open up to questions for folks. If, if people have questions, um, you're more than welcome to ask them. Uh, oh, sorry, I thought that was a, sorry, talk. I thought that was a, oh, that was a hello. Sorry, I thought it was a hand raise. Um, <laughs> Uh, questions? Questions? Uh, yeah, it's fine. Actually, I don't really have a question. I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Lai for taking us on this incredible journey. Uh, you gave us an amazing uh, view of, of a very 
dense and complicated cultural history and you did the marvelous job. Actually, I do have a little question. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you were talking about your poetics at some point, and correct me if I didn't hear you, you know, rightly, you called the poetical uh, unmethod. Yes. Yeah, so I wonder whether you could expand on that. Oh, Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Smaro, for the kind words and, and for the question. It was indeed a little dense. I, I didn't realize how dense it was till I was up there. I'm like, oh, this is kind of dense. Um, I hope people are able to follow me, okay? Um, yes, I indeed, it's on my mind, you know, very much these days. As, as I grow older, um, and because of all of these years in the classroom, um, trying to figure out how to talk to young folks about how to do this kind of work. And many do indeed seem to be looking for a formula. It would be nice to have a set of rules to follow to do the work in a good way. And the sad news is I, I don't think such a thing is possible. But I've been working with this concept of poetics that I get from our, our good friend Fred Waugh in the first instance. So um, he talks about it as what surrounds you like your house. It's where you live. It's a run-on sentence. What surrounds you like your house. It's where you live. Um which I really love because I, I feel that what he's offering just in that little line is, you know, it's an ethics of living, right? And an ethics of being beside others as others unfold beside you. You can't know what's, gonna, what's going on, you know, for, for Robert or Siobhan or for anybody, we can't know. Um, and that is the real difficulty of knowing the other that I, that I sort of was clumsily trying to diagram in that, in that Waterhouse painting that, it's really difficult to lift one's gaze actually from the pool, from the gazing pool to, to recognize the other. And the other will always come out and surprise us. And I think it's for this reason that there can't be a method for being in that relation. And so then I use the concept of the poetic because it's from the poets, you know, that I've learned so much about the possibilities of parataxis, of putting things side by side in order to see the surprises that might emerge from them or sitting side by side with others in order to see the surprises, right? That might emerge in conversation or even sitting in silence together. And for me, that's where the real power of the work lies. It's scary at school when you wanna grade because <laughs> it's not a formula, but I think it might actually be a better way to do the work. Um, questions? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, a really, really fascinating talk. Um, about maybe five minutes before the end, you had this phrase that was about either the ethics or the theory of the unfinished. And in context, you were talking about it as a warning against the dangers of closure with identity and multiculturalism. But out of context, as an artist, do you see some value in the unfinished instead of moving towards closure? Can you talk like a little bit more about the purpose and what you're getting at with this idea of unfinishing things or leaving oh, them sure. before premature closure. Thank, thank you, Ian. Um, it's a great question. I might have to ask you what you mean by as an artist. I'll tell you, okay, I'll tell you first what I mean by it politically, which is that, so a lot of this has to do with other writing I've been doing around the concept of utopia for anybody who's been tracking me on that topic. Um, and again, you know, so much, I sort of feel like, you know, I figure I have about a decade left and I'm kind of just trying to stay focused on bringing this stuff to the next generation because I feel they really need it. And I'm really conscious, you know, when one is, for the, for those who suffer and because we're human, we all do. Um, it's really easy to, to do a simple kind of, th that simple kind of work of utopianism, which is imagine an ideal push, 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 imagine that when I get there, then every we're getting clear, everything's gonna be good. And in the drive towards getting clear in that in that kind of way, I'm thinking about Leonard Cohen, um, in the drive towards getting clear in that kind of way, we perhaps don't pay as much attention to the journey, you know, as we might otherwise, because we're so fixated on that closure, on that finishedness. And in those moments, so I think maybe, you know, um, when I'm critical of things like pieces of le legislation, government policy, that kind of stuff, 
Um, it's because I really fear the danger that once we get that apology or that act that recognizes us, the things that we think we want, right? Um, that they can tend in fact to shut down any remainder. And in fact, I mean, so much of life is the remainder um, that's still roiling beneath the surface. And by using the language of closure, we can in fact shut down other calls for injustice that may echo earlier calls, so other calls for justice that may echo earlier calls for justice that still hasn't been expiated. So that's what I mean when I talk about it politically, but I love your question about how and what it might mean in relation to art. Could you say a little bit more about so does a project mark, does a book, it's sort of a fixed physical object mark uh -huh. the end of a project? Is there um, a space, or are you suggesting a kind of poetics of uh, publishing the process or sharing the process yeah. or not coming to these end terminal points, yes. artistic production? Yes, you know? yes. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question, Ian. It's for all of us writers, right, who want to publish that book with the big press and win, a, win an award, whatever. Um, we do indeed drive towards these finished pol po polished things that we want to be held up as the, these objects of beauty. It's not so different in a way from the political process, right? When you know you're writing a book, the bulk of what you're doing when you're writing in a book, you're sitting in a room by yourself, having this extraordinary experience all alone <laughs> that um, that is never quite the thing acknowledged when it's acknowledged, right? And so what would it be, I wonder, I wonder this a lot because writing is so hard. Um, what would it be to value that practice of that kind of solitary, agonized work of contemplation and the work of the making rather than the work of the of the completion and you know, and the award and the um because they're really different moments in the life of a writer. They feel really different, right? One is profoundly lonely. And the other is really, really social. And yet we sort of we, we tend to hold up the, the social moment when in fact the work was all done in the solitary. Um I don't know, those are my thoughts. But I mean I also think, you know, why does the book have to be finished just because it's published? We can always revise it. It's not done, but good. Thank you. Um before we go on to the audience, um, Shaban, are there questions that you'd like to? So I, I will do this and pass the mic back. This is a long one. It's quite wonderful. So you might want to have, I might pass the screen over. So this is, hi, Dr. Lai, CR from the poetry vlog here. Thank you for this research, thought-provoking talk. I've learned so much as always from your insights. You touched on two ideas in particular, the narcissism of white nationalism and the use of coalition work across and even because of productive difference. One aspect of narcissism is how the preoccupation with the self comes from a deep uncertainty about the self's true identity and worth, which fosters an intolerance of anything different from the perceived self. This made me think about how maybe the coalition work you reference can be effective because it comes from a place of certainty about the self's identity and worth, which fosters appreciation for difference. Where does kinship and your theory of echolocation come into play with this coalition work? Do you see that work as part of a coalition strategy or perhaps separate but also needed? That's an amazing question. Um, this is C.R. Grimmer. They run a really interesting poetry vlog. Um, shoot, sorry, C.R., I can't remember what city you're out of. But um, they did a really fantastic, um, or at least I really enjoyed the interview that I did with them um, in Seattle a number of years ago. And they're a really wonderful community builder through like contemporary poetry and poetics in the U.S. Could I please see the question? Because that was always <laughs> really dense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they're asking about the narcissism of white nationalism, to which I would add, not just because nationalism is not exclusive, regardless of where it comes from. There's no way around it, for better or for worse. And the use of coalition work across, I mean, because of this. 
the arbitrations are self-constrained and certain about the self, right? Okay, so they're asking about whether coalitional work can be effective if it comes from because it comes from a place of certainty about the self's identity and work, which fosters appreciation of persistence. Okay, I think I, I see what you're asking. Okay, so, sorry, can I hang on to this? Yeah. Thanks, because <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> um, so CR is asking, so they're rightly concerned about the problem of nationalism as a, a narcissistic stance. I mean, the problem with making a claim to nationalism is you're never quite sure if you sort of fit in your box, your ticky box sufficiently, right? So there's always an anxiety when one is cla claiming an identity of any kind. It's never for anybody, uh, never complete, never fully grounded. And so this is what CR is recognizing. And then they're asking if um, when doing coalition work, because you're in conversation with the other, if you you can be more certain if you're, if you're identity, I think, I hope that's what you're asking, because I see you, you see me, you see me in a certain way, I see you in a certain way, and we can therefore be more fixed in one another's eyes. I don't know that I think that that's necessarily the case. I think that anytime one is doing work from one identity to the next, I don't think that the solidity, I don't think that identity necessarily becomes any more solid but one can still have an apprehension of it in conversation with others more fully because it's moving and growing, right? As we're doing coalitional work together. So that would be my response to that. And then where does kinship in your theory of echolocation come into play with this coalition work? Coalition work? Do you see that work as a part of coalitional strategy or perhaps separate, but also needed? That is a really good question. I have not got there yet. Um, so so I was just developing this idea for this talk, like this is new work for, for the event today. Um, so where does kinship in the theory of echolocation play into the work of coalition? I mean, I think if we're all doing the work, if we're all bats and we're all listening and calling to one another and pinging ideas, senses of self, ideas for how to make a better future, ways of remembering the past, often against one another. It can be a kind of kinship work if one is listening. And one might get, right, this sort of overlapping cacophony of noise. Yes, and so in fact, the one thing that I cut from this talk with great regret because I could not, this was, that was the shortest I could make it, friends. Um, but I did want to, I, I was hoping to close with a little clip from um, uh, the Japanese Canadian um, sound artist, Nobuo Kubota. I don't know if anybody in this room knows his work. He's this really beautiful Toronto based sound artist who plays with both the sound and the visuality of language um, and does, CR, I'm gonna send you a video. Um, does this really amazing work where he's making noises that are like, correct human noises for the production of language, but he produces them nonsensically. And then he produces them using a loop in layer over one another, sometimes using video and sometimes just using audio. And so you get exactly that sort of cacophony, you get this sort of cacophonous overlapping sense of, you know, um, reverberation, echo, um, voices calling out to one another, returning, but sometimes overlapping with one another at the same time. So possibly there might be the beginnings of a model for a kind of sonic kinship in that kind of way, maybe? Thanks for the question, it's a great question. Can I ask a follow-up question based on the kinship question? Um, actually, for me, one of the things that really struck me was the use of the bat, the, the, the ways in which the bat becomes such a figural, metaphorical, methodological entry point for this entire talk. Um, so I think for me, when I was listening to it, I was thinking kinship is precisely that, like an attention to a kind of relationality between the non-human, right? And the kind of ways that, so there was such a generative um, and generous way with, with which, right? The talk politicizes the bat as the thing that we do not want to not associate with, right? Like the kind of ways that, you know, the, so, so I think to me, when I was hearing it, it's a challenge to 
Asian Canadian studies that thinks of a particular politics of disavowal, mm -hmm. right, from the things that we're supposed to actually not identify with. Yes. It was so um, powerful to actually use both its method and its metaphor as an approach to the field itself. Oh, and so then I was wondering then as a curiosity, um, do you feel like that move, because I, I, you know, having, you know, like just read all, like all, all of your work, actually, that, that it's a it's a it's a it's part of a repertoire of really thinking through an eco critical understanding of the kind of ways in which we we are like affected by the bat, like you said, but we also affect the bat. So I felt like it was such a. It was such a kind of uh, recuperative, right? And so, you know, you think about redress in the last part of your talk, yeah. but this is another form of it. I'm hearing another form of redressive politics that does not disavow the very thing that you become a metaphor of, right? Instead, utilizes those very same things in ways that productively see kinship, productively see intimacy, productively see listening and seeing. Oh my right? goodness, Robert, you're so articulate about it. No, no, I'm just like, I'm so literally much. repeating what was like what, was in the... what, what he said. That was what he was trying to get at, but you just articulated it so beautifully. Thank you. I mean, I'm like, no, no, I mean, yes. It's, it's, yeah. it's... Because of course it's that, right? And so I'm thinking, because COVID, when we're, it was such a weird kind of intimacy with one another. Mm -hmm. You'd kill another being with your breath. Like how intimate, like it's terrible, mm -hmm. um, but it's also so close and so far. So there's this strange sort of sense of, you know, proximity and distance through the virus and our relation to the to the animal world mm -hmm. um, in that. And of course, you know, it's all our mess that has been upsetting their habitats and making it possible. I mean, assuming, depending on which theory you think is true, right? And that's part of the difficulty of erasure. Um, but, uh, yeah, that the viral opens up exactly that kind of intimacy. Mm -hmm. And I really, you just articulated so beautifully that thing. Yes, indeed, that we are part of the work of the racism against us is because we're seen as being closer to this disgusting little bat. Um, but we don't see how we actually have a responsibility to these creatures that are not disgusting at all. They're part of the world that we inhabit and that we forget mm -hmm. in order when we're seeking a certain kind of cleanliness and a certain kind of closure. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really shifts the way that one might engage the politics um, if one thinks in, in that way. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Um, yes, a question at the back. <clears throat> I really liked the idea of darkness you were talking about. So I was just trying to think about that. Are, are you suggest? I mean, it jives with my experience as a Asian Canadian, not knowing who I was, figuring out what that meant. It uh, took a long time. So are you saying that Asian Canadians don't know who they are or they haven't been able to express who they are? And how does that map onto Asian Canadian studies? Oh, good question. I owe an email, I'm so sorry, from like a long time back, I'll write you back, I promise. <laughs> um. No, I'm not saying that Asian Canadians don't know who they are. I'm hmm. I'm only saying that Asian Canadians don't know who they are insofar as I don't think anybody knows who they are. But Asian Canadians' relationship to that mode of not knowing is specific to the to racial formation. Um so sorry, what's the second half of the question is how can we no, I lost the second half. How does that relate to Asian Canadian studies? How does that relate to Asian Canadian studies? That is a very excellent question. And it's what I'm trying to puzzle out in this talk. So I, yeah, I obviously didn't compose this talk for no reason. I'm imagining what my work is going to be here for the next decade and trying to think about how I might productively help in the shaping of a discipline when we're in a moment in relation to the university as an idea. Um, and also when we're inhabiting such a messy historical moment, and I tried to articulate some of that mess at the start of the talk, um, that so much is needed and the work of framing is so difficult. And so for tonight, I'm offering the bat 
as a figure of the discipline, actually, right? The bat that goes out on a different flight every night and from its little bat roost and calls out to whoever's listening or whatever insects it might catch or other bats it might connect with. Whatever's there in the forest, we don't know. Um, I guess that's kind of my tentative kind of poetical model for the discipline tonight. Mm -hmm. It may shift again, of course. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And we have time for, um, uh, Shaban, is there another question there? Um, well, maybe we can ask two questions, like this question, and then also, and then if there's a final question in the audience, uh, uh, Tuck, please. Okay. I, I will ask my question now and comment, and thank you very much for that, the talk, and I'm really taken by the uh, echo idea. And again, as you say, sort of working with what is assumed to be disgusting as actually a potential for liberating us from what we think is civilized and uh, normal behavior, I think is really great. And also the way in which I think it advances a kind the idea of um, relationality in, in a more complicated way when things are very rapid, the pinging going on, and then the ways in which you sort of navigate the world uh, around you. And what I'm kind of, um, my question really is a, a, again about the discipline issue and the ways in which, um, you know, something you, you talked about like Asian Canadian studies and then Asian American studies, and there's a way in which you're saying, affirming the necessity of it, but at the same time, um, um, thinking about the ways we may go on, go beyond it, because oh, mm -hmm. something like Asian Canadian or Asian American as a is a kind of national formation yes. is you know and, and it's created national canons and and so forth exactly. so i'm 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 wondering how we go beyond that at the current moment you know how we make something which is different and you talk about you know north american asian north american or asian um uh turtle island whatever that might be you know i mean where do we go from here in terms of um, Asian Canadian studies, if it's not to be a reification right. of the formation that we're working through, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. how do we go yeah. in it and come out the other side somehow? Yes, exactly. Tak, thank you so much. It's an excellent question and it's a really important one. I really appreciate it. I think what I was trying to do in the talk was track what the, you know, in so far as one can do so in such a short space of time track at least some highlights in the conversation so far and the formations that esteemed colleagues have tried on. Um, and then I've been trying to, was trying to articulate what the productivities of those formations were. I think it's really important that we don't throw the history out, right? So however problematic the frames were, they were also immensely productive and they created the conditions for us to be here in this room together today. And then do I, what do I do with the category? I've already said the bat, but it's, you know, it becomes facetious after a certain point because I recognize and what I didn't talk about and probably need to begin thinking about is the fact that, you know, there's a, a set of real historical material conditions real historically grounded um, identities that people embrace and carry as a matter, as a true matter of way of knowing oneself in the world that's really important. And so what one does disciplinarily, I mean, I still do think that that figure of, you know, the zigzagging movement is really important. That because we do, because work was done, because real lives were lived, real sufferings were suffered, real justice was achieved, um, real incorporation happened. We can't let go of any of those things. They're, they matter. So sometimes it's important to sort of zig to those positions. But then it's also important to recognize the instability, the instabilities in them 
and then zag out of them to sort of see, find, like look for these other kinds of tendrils that, that we've been talking about. And I think maybe that's the way, you know, so that we don't necessarily throw out containers that are still perfectly serviceable, but we, we, and we, but we recognize them for their historical rootedness, for their embodiedness, for the feeling, for the, you know, for all the, all the struggle, all the fights, all of the things that were achieved. And then we also look to the kinds of possibilities and relationships that can be built out from that place. And we shift those things. I mean, that's the, the productivity of the work of genealogy, right? Is that it's always possible to look into history and find things, not everything, history is not like a, a bottomless suitcase, it doesn't have everything in it, but it has yet still a lot of unexpected things that we might find to help us thread our ways out to other places when we need to. Does that sort of answer? It's a tough question, I, yeah, but, but it's so important, thank you. Sure. Um, so the question is from Kathy. Hey. Uh, so thanks so much, Carissa, for a fascinating, thought-provoking talk. Oh, sorry. Oh. I was wondering if you could further clarify the extent to which you think cultural significance is indeed cultural, as with, for example, the history of the bat. Do you think cultural significance is inflected a posteriori by political considerations or is fundamentally produced by them? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> What, what, come on, give, where's the low balls over there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have a little look again. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you, thank you. Hello, how? Thank you so much for attending, and thank you for the question. I, I really appreciate it. It's, it's an excellent question. It's just hard. <laughs> Let me have a little boo. I was wondering if you could clarify. You could fur clarify further the extent to which you think cultural significance is indeed cultural. As for example, the history of the bat, do you think cultural significance is inflected a posteriori by political considerations or is it fundamentally produced by them? So is it there in a prior kind of way? Probably both, how? Yeah. I mean, there has to be a there, something there in order for a person to register it as a problem in the first place, right? So this figure of the bat. Is it produced by, like, is it there attached to Asianness prior to the COVID moment? Not in the city, yes, but obviously it's intensified, like, you know, to, to a power of 10 by the COVID moment because the bad is ima imagined as this sort of figure of a kind of origin, um, an origin that could be clocked except for certain conditions in the Wuhan market. So so yes, it's, yes, it's, it's both. It's both, it's, I don't know how to answer this question. It's both, it's both, but there's an intensification at, in certain historical moments for particular reasons. I guess that's how I would answer that. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Larissa. I do think it's both. <laughs> I completely agree. I mean, I, I completely agree. And see it as a kind of, I mean, that's why you cited, right, material from the 19th century, right? The kind of ways that temporarily they become flashpoints for thinking about a subject formation. Yes. But actually, in many ways, it's not a question of when, but rather the process itself. Yes. And the, the ways that this process is actually inflect and emerge over and over again. And that the answers might have to be different because we have to echolocate ourselves within these sort of... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just because I was like I'm totally I'm getting what you're I mean I understood it um but on that note um we'd like to thank Professor and Dr. Larissa Lai for this wonderful talk echolocating us within these sort of discourses and and really asking us to hear to understand and and to really pay attention thank you Marcus thank you I always want to bring to now Larissa and Robert <laughs> with uh, um, 
Thank you. I always want to bring Robert and Larissa with me. Now I can even repeat it, echo myself basically, <laughs> because now the, the microphone is on. So thank you so very much. I always found the Narcissus and Echo story one of the saddest stories. Um, and I always felt it's it's so Narcissus is in, in a, engrossed in an activity that is so sad and isolating both for Narcissus and for Echo. So I'm I'm so particularly grateful for the allegory that you brought to us, but not stop there as an analysis of what's going wrong, what has been going wrong for centuries, what's going on right now. But in a very typical, I want to say, Larissa Lai move, you brought us hope, hope in the in the figure of the bat, uh, an active figure, a figure that uses echo not as a nostalgic. Um, uh, hearkening back, um, but as a as a way to connect uh, and and a way to be active together. So I'm extremely grateful for this wonderful uh, talk. Um, I hope you will not deem it a narcissistic comment when I say I knew that university college would gain immensely, <laughs> and. I know that we that we are and that we have. So um, I'm so very grateful. This concludes tonight's uh, lecture. Um, thank you all for your thoughtful questions, both in the room and online. Special thanks, of course, to Professor Larissa Lai, to Robert Diaz and Shivano Flynn for moderating. Um, I also would like to thank the University College staff advancement team, events team, um, my office for preparing and running this event, especially Molly Rosen, Edith Tomarway, Emily Sands, uh, Casey Conklin, uh, and many others. Um, I would like to again thank the audience for great questions in the Q&A um, and also for coming out, for attending uh, both in this room and, and out there um, everywhere. Um, uh, before we move on to the social part, at least for those of the other social part, at least for those who are in the room, um, I'd like to um, plug um, uh, uh, a little bit for the next two lectures that are coming uh, to University College this month. Uh, the Tietzel lecture on November 16, which will be a conversation between acclaimed Abenaki filmmaker Alanis Obomswin and TIFF CAO um, Cameron Bailey, uh, November 16, uh, in this building. And then the Priestly Lectures with Dene Scholar and Political Scientist Glenn Coulthard from, you know, uh, from UBC, November 28 to 30th. So um, check our website for our events. Um, I encourage you all to attend, and I hope to see many of you there. For those of you here in person, I would like to invite you for a small reception just next door in the senior common room. Please stay and enjoy some food and drink. But before we do, let us thanks, give thanks once again to our uh, Richard Charles Lee Chair and Chinese Canadian Studies, Professor Larissa. Bell. I know, because I totally got it. Like, I totally got it. Like, it's probably something.